Nick Deolius bringing you the far middle in the month of March. That's the month, of course, of hoop madness. Finally here after that long, dreary start of the year with winter. And our dedication for this episode is going to focus on an evolution that occurred in the sports world that became more noted for its massive impact in the business and cultural worlds that that fed into. Yeah, how today's monster of the NFL became the NFL as we know it. Because the old NFL resembled little of today's profit, cultural, and entertainment behemoth. Now, let me start by illustrating where the NFL started to turn and morph. The startling transformation began in earnest around 1960, largely because of circumstances providing an opportunity for a leader to ascend to the top of the league and become a pathfinder. His name and our dedication subject is Pete Rozelle, and we'll get to him in a second. But first, understand what the NFL was just before Roselle. In the world of football, as a business enterprise, teams in the league that was the NFL faced bleak times toward the end of the 1950s. The NFL consisted of a dozen teams back then, and only two of them were west of the Mississippi River. Those were the Rams and the 49ers out in California. And by the late 1950s, many of those dozen teams were facing financial stress. In-person attendance It was decent across the league, but the television coverage was very limited at best. And part of the reason for that was by design of the league and its commissioner, Bert Bell. Now, Bell famously once told a reporter that you can't give fans a game for free on TV and also expect them to go to the ballpark. Bell, he suddenly dies in 1959 while he was attending, by the way, a game between the Steelers and the Eagles. So now you've got a struggling league they had found itself without a leader. But as history has shown time and again, unexpected challenges or vacuums, they're often filled by innovation and great leaders. That was exactly what transpired with the NFL in late 1959 and into early 1960, when after Bell's death and an interim commissioner, a man by the name of Pete Rozelle became NFL commissioner in 1960. He was 33 years old and became and remains to this day the youngest commissioner in the history of the NFL. Here's a startling fact for you. It took 23 ballots by league team owners to affirm Rizal, who was a surprise choice. It was the best decision the NFL ever made, and I'm sure many teams and owners look back in time and shuddered to think what would have been lost if they got that decision wrong. Rizal would become the greatest innovator, business disruptor, and value creator in the history of professional sport, And there are different metrics and ways to illustrate the magnitude of Roselle's impact. I'll give you just a few. Perhaps the best is culturally. Before Roselle, professional football was a distant second in popularity to baseball in America's mind. And heck, one could argue boxing was of more interest than football across America before Roselle. But after Roselle, no, strike that. Only a few years of Roselle at the helm of the NFL. That's all it took. Football became America's number one sport. There's a Harris poll from the mid-1960s that shows football surpassing baseball was America's most popular spectator sport, by the way. And that's the combination of Pete Rozelle's vision, coupled with his ability to integrate key aspects of American life and technology, such as television, all at the right time. But if you're more of a numbers person, consider what Rozelle accomplished when it came to TV revenue for the NFL. During Bert Bell's reign, when and when Roselle took over at the start of his uh, his tenure, pro clubs made their own television contracts, which meant small market teams they often didn't do very well. Roselle began to change that. He started with a TV deal with CBS for almost five million dollars, and at the start of the 1960s, that was a serious amount of money. But then he did something else that was crucial and stands to this day. He employed a new revenue sharing strategy for the league. TV revenues and other revenues would be pooled across the NFL and then redistributed in a way that guaranteed profitability for every team, no matter how they performed on the field. It was simple and it was genius. Now, there was only one problem. Rizal's scheme of revenue sharing presented a legal challenge in the arena of antitrust. So Rizal went to D.C. and he started a lobby. His effort led to the Sports Broadcasting Act of 1961, And that law provided a professional sports league the ability to sell all games of its individual teams as a package. Now, that sounds nuanced and simple, 
but it was the tweak that dramatically catalyzed the business of not just football, but much of professional sport. Now, here's those numbers to put all this into perspective. Toward the end of Burt Bell's reign, TV revenue was incidental to the NFL. And at the start of Roselle's reign, TV revenue jumped, as I said, to almost $5 million, which locked in profitability through revenue sharing for all NFL franchises. Today, annual television revenue for the NFL approaches $12 billion a year. And the viewership is as large as the revenues. Nielsen data show that 93 out of 100 of the most watched TV programs in 2023, they were NFL games. And of course, the number one overall, not surprisingly, is the Super Bowl. Now, 93 out of 100, that is total domination, constant listeners. And when you've got that type of viewership, you get to set the revenue dollars that you'll receive from TV. A third and final perspective is useful, I think, to appreciate Roselle's impact. For years in the early 1960s, his salary from the NFL was $50,000 a year. Today, Commissioner Roger Goodell makes about $64 million per year. $50,000 to $64 million. That shows and correlates to the financial power of the NFL that Roselle built with vision, innovation, and solid strategy. Pete Roselle's impact is one of business and culture, much more than sport. And by the way, he grew up in the Depression, and he was straight out of Compton, California. And he went to high school with Duke Snyder, the center field Hall of Famer. And Roselle was a Navy veteran serving in World War II, and his recorded first name at birth wasn't Peter but Alvin. Now, I've got my issues with the modern day NFL as a sports fan, but Pete Rozell is someone who transcended sport and represents what America has to offer, no matter what your profession or cultural interests. Episode 146's dedication goes to the commish above all other commissioners, Pete Rozell. I thought you'd enjoy that dedication to the innovator, Pete Rozell, but now we're off on our connection journey for this episode of The Far Middle, The NFL's headquarters, they are found on Park Avenue in New York City, and that will connect us into the theme of this episode, which are my observations and notes coming off of a recent trip to the Big Apple. New York City has gone from one of my favorite places to visit, whether it's for business or pleasure, to a location that I've done my best to avoid the past four or five years. In fact, this recent trip, which spanned only two short days, was my first time back in New York since covid But for those of you that read my book, Precipice, and that regularly listen to this podcast, you know that I've been watching the state of the Big Apple for some time. Many of the policies pursued by its leadership, unfortunately, are those embraced by the left and are proving to be New York City's ruin, both culturally and financially. So I found myself in early February back in the Big Apple feeling a little bit like a stranger, despite not long ago New York feeling maybe not to the extent of a second home to me, but certainly feeling familiar and comfortable. And over those two days, I made it a point to talk to as many residents and business people and workers and business owners as possible. And these conversations coupled with observations, I thought they'd be of interest for a far middle discussion. And one should always be careful when generalizing, but what I tried to do with the upcoming discussion is to hit issues where there was strong consensus across all the conversations that I had. Yeah, it's not scientific by any stretch, but I do have a high degree of confidence uh, that what we're about to discuss reflects the views and opinions of the majority of New Yorkers. And I suspect there's going to be some surprises for you. So let's get started. How about the current state of crime? That is a massively large issue in New York. Well, I spent most of the time there in Soho and Tribeca and lower Manhattan. Honestly, I went in with a bit of trepidation when it came to safety Yet I found it wasn't as bad as I had feared. Now, it wasn't great, mind you, but it wasn't an all out of control, free for all type of a situation. But clearly the vibe and atmosphere when you walk around the streets of Manhattan, they're tense these days. And this isn't the happy-go-lucky New York City of the late 90s and early 2000s era. Today, New York is on edge everywhere you go. Commuters are tense. Business owners are tense. The police are tense. There's a sensation that anything could go off at any moment, and I assume that sensation is based off of current precedent and recent experience. And there's a strong police presence, but it's purely a veneer of optical presence. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the NYPD vehicles, you see, they're prolific, they're everywhere, 
And you do see a lot of NYPD officers standing or walking around different neighborhoods. But you get the sense that it's more for show. And the officers are hesitant, perhaps instructed to not engage proactively when certain situations arise. They feel more like observers or monitors than protectors. Yeah, the police are present, sort of. And the feeling is that the logo is there, but that individual citizens, they might end up being on their own if trouble finds them. Which leads to the second observation on crime and safety, which is the presence of third-party security everywhere. Security guards outside the doors of stores, security guards inside retailers, security in the lobby of hotels, and security personnel inside the lobby and outside on the sidewalks of office towers. It's as if the private sector has become worried enough in the ability of the police to protect so that now the private sector takes it upon itself to provide its own security to protect residents, customers, workers, and property. The NYPD discussion takes us smoothly into the next connection, which is where the approval rating sits with perhaps the most famous NYPD alum, who is Mayor Adams. And I got to admit, I sort of like the guy, even though he is far too left for my persuasion. But maybe that's not saying much, considering his predecessor was Bill de Blasio, who I couldn't dislike more. But Adams was NYPD. He talked a great game coming into the mayor's office, and he struck me as someone who could balance these different interests when it came to crime, safety, and police resident relations. But I'm sorry to tell you that the approval rating of Eric Adams by New Yorkers is beyond bad currently. Someone told me, and then I had to verify this later because I couldn't believe it, but Adams hit an all-time record low approval rating for a New York City mayor in December of 2023 late last year, registering less than a 30% approval rating. Adams is suffering from a host of issues. Um, Lack of affordable housing is a a big problem for him. Safety concerns, right, that we just discussed are of concern. Um, Budget cuts and lack of police hiring, they also weigh as troubles, maybe related problems. 60% disapprove of his handling of crime, by the way. And he's also suffering from an image problem that stems from corruption allegations that recently surfaced. Only 40% of voters polled said he displays strong leadership, and only a third of voters say he's honest and trustworthy. But there is one issue that might sort of rise to the top among all those issues in importance when it comes to Eric Adams' uh, lack of approval. What might that issue be? Well, it's our next connection, and it is the migrant crisis. And it's clearly a crisis in New York with a capital C. It's what everyone I spoke to wants to talk about. And New Yorkers are not shy about speaking bluntly on it, and they're beyond upset. Now, my timing on this topic needs to be framed up. Just a few days before my arrival, there was an assault by a group of individuals, and maybe a mob is the best way to describe them, who were reported to be migrants on police officers in the middle of Times Square. The assault was caught on video, and it's pretty frightening and disturbing, which is bad enough. But then two things happened after. First, a few of those who allegedly assaulted the officers were booked, and when they were leaving what I assumed to be a police station or a court, cameras caught them giving the middle finger multiple times, with a smug attitude to boot. And this image created outrage not just in New York City, but across the nation. I'm sure many of you have already seen uh, photos or clips of it. And it sums up everything that's going wrong with things like the border and millions of migrants pouring across the border and in sanctuary cities where they end up, like New York City. The migrant crisis and the concentrated problems it brings to sanctuary cities, that might be the best pair of examples as to what happens when society allows the left to run things. And New Yorkers are starting to realize that because it's affecting their lives in the most fundamental of ways. Now, the second thing that happened after this uh, Times Square assault on the police officers was what the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg did. He refused to seek bail for the alleged attackers. Now, cops and many residents fumed to media that the DA Bragg made a mockery of the entire justice system by letting five suspects walk after they were arraigned on charges of second-degree assault on a police officer and for obstruction of governmental administration in that shocking attack. I mean, if you walk on those charges... It sends a message that literally anything goes on the streets with no consequence. Here's a quote from a city resident who also happened to be a cop. What this does is open the window for all people to say we can beat up cops and nothing is going to happen to us. 
And uh, here's another quote. We talk about it all the time. We're a catch and release city. This is a complete joke. We put bad people behind bars to keep the community safe and they just keep on letting them out. I really don't understand what their agenda is. What's interesting is that the high levels of frustration uh, that exist across New York City, they also exist within the gig economy and workers in the gig economy when it comes to the migrant mess. And that sort of surprised me. I didn't see that coming. And when you think it through, it's pretty obvious. That's because the gig economy workers, they are abiding by pretty onerous New York City regulations, while migrants, in some instances, they're setting up their own cash-based gigs and shops without any regard to regulations and paperwork. And that creates an unfair economic advantage, displacing business and revenue for the gig workers abiding by the rules, many of which, by the way, are immigrants themselves. And it basically creates two economies, the second being a growing rogue economy. Just check out the uh, the Brooklyn Bridge or around the Brooklyn Bridge for the size of that rogue economy. You'll be shocked. So the migrant crisis, it's on everyone's mind in New York. Um, corporate suits on Wall Street talk about it, cabbies, residents, cops, TV reporters, you name it. You can't escape the topic. And after watching the news or spending a few hours walking around New York, you know why. And obviously, um, it's a problem, but strangely enough, it's a situation that is uniting New Yorkers across the political spectrum. Now, I'm not sure if you're going to find too many uh, what I would call MAGA Republicans in Manhattan. Probably not. But most Democrats and liberal Manhattanites that I know or spoke to, um, I've heard that they've got not just very strong views on this issue, that uh, they're also screaming for action on the issue. Uh, to stem what they view as a serious public crisis, and it is a public crisis. But they also sound more and more like Republicans when it comes to the migrant situation and leftist DAs and sanctuary city policies. It's very interesting. Although the uh, migrant crisis and public safety, they might loom largest on the minds of New Yorkers today, there is a topic that is related to both and that is also near top of mind in the Big Apple, and that is the state of transportation. Let's connect. First, the subway. It's a mess. Crime, fare evasion, rodents, on and on. All these drivers create a situation where those who can avoid the subway do so, and those that must utilize the subway, they just find a way to endure it as best they can. And tied to this is the increasing cost of driving in Manhattan. Later this year, New York's going to implement what it references as congestion pricing for Midtown Manhattan. And we talked about this on prior episodes of the far middle. It's a blatant cash grab, one that will serve as a regressive tax on working New Yorkers and small business owners and commuters who are trying to make ends meet. The congestion pricing tax is tied to the plight of public transportation and the subway in New York. The former is needed basically to subsidize the latter. So let me explain. The uh, Metropolitan Transportation Authority, or the MTA, it runs the buses and subways in New York City. It's the beneficiary of the congestion pricing plan. And consider this, drivers entering Manhattan south of 60th Street could end up paying under this plan a daily driving tax of $15, which works out to $4,000 a year. Now, if you've got an easy pass, the rate drops, but you still pay a tax. And it gets worse. The MTA will have the unilateral authority to declare a gridlock alert day whenever it wants to. And under gridlock alert days, there's going to be a 25% surge on pricing that's added to the tax and the invoice. And New York State reserves the right to raise the congestion tax by 10% in 2024, which would be the very first year of the tax. Thank you very much. So let's illustrate why this is such a big deal for working New York City area residents. If you live in New Jersey and you work in Manhattan, Driving in to work and out of work will result in almost $25 a day in congestion fees, which is on top of the already $17 a day in bridge and tunnel tolls. Now that works out to over $40 a day, and we didn't even get to the cost of gas and parking. Now, does that sound like a formula that's going to get more people back to work in Manhattan to fill those vacant office buildings and to support the struggling restaurant industry and to breathe life into a struggling city? You think this is going to attract businesses? Of course it doesn't and it won't. But that doesn't stop brazen public officials from touting congestion pricing as a way to solve gridlock and to improve air quality. 
And just think of what the MTA will be able to squander with all this newfound revenue. They need to reform and improve services. Those are going to be squashed. Failure is going to be rewarded. And the inferior transportation option will effectively be the mandated one. Now, those paying the highest price for this regressive tax are going to be the usual victims, the working poor, the underserved communities, small business owners, and middle-class workers. But expect something that should be squashed immediately under objective analysis to be something instead that is shoved down each of these stakeholders' throats in the near future. Yes, the plight of New York City might be getting worse before it gets better. All these issues and challenges, they hit small business owners in Manhattan hard. Drives up their costs, it creates scarcity of workers, it shoves paying customers away from the business, and it's a true existential crisis for these small business owners, much more worrisome, by the way, than atmospheric CO2 and climate change. Years ago, I became acquaintances with a restaurant owner in Little Italy, right on Mulberry Street, which is in the heart of Little Italy in Manhattan. And it always reminds me of that song by Billy Joel, Big Man on Mulberry Street, which he wrote about Manhattan's Little Italy neighborhood. Anyway, I had a chance to catch up with my buddy on this trip and enjoyed an awesome lunch at his establishment. And he is as fed up as er anyone, and maybe everyone, regarding all these issues uh, swirling around quality of life in New York City. And one of the areas hit hardest by the combination of these issues is the foot traffic in the table occupancy in Little Italy and in close by Chinatown. Now, these were always heavily dependent on tourism and visitors to New York versus residents. And when tables are empty and the streets are not filled with sightseers in Little Italy and Chinatown, it usually means that there's a tourism problem across all of New York. And exactly that's what's occurring today. I caught up with him on a Friday afternoon. There was no one milling around Little Italy and very few tables occupied across the restaurants. And each restaurant now basically employs a promoter to stand at its entrance, hyping the food and selections to try to entice the few potential customers to enter. Most of the restaurants in the neighborhood are no longer open for lunch during the weekday, which to your host, who is an unsophisticated yet passionate foodie, that's tragic. Now, pandemic shutdowns killed these restaurants. Labor regulations are killing the restaurants. Skyrocketing rents are killing them. Concerns about safety are killing them. And no one returning to work in nearby office buildings are killing them. And a lack of tourists are killing them. And congestion pricing is going to kill them. Costs keep going up, but revenue keeps getting pressured down. That creates a vicious cycle. And before you know it, corners get cut. Selections on the menu are limited and the experience overall of dining there is diminished. It's sad, and it's happening in one of the most iconic tourist spots in all of Manhattan, which means it's happening all across New York City. Let's wrap this uh, episode for a New York City update. Let's wrap it with a giant mystery, one that is visible from Mulberry Street in Little Italy. I mentioned I was down around Tribeca during this recent trip, and that neighborhood contains one of Manhattan's most mysterious buildings, and it sticks out like a sore thumb. It's known as the Long Lines Building, and it holds many secrets. Built in 1974, the 29-story windowless behemoth at 33 Thomas Street, it's loomed over the Tribeca neighborhood, but few have ventured beyond its front door, and even fewer have gone on record about what they've seen inside. It's ugly, in my opinion. Now, there are no windows, as I said, on the skyscraper, zero windows, and the architectural style is known as Brutalist, and I think that name is quite fitting when you look at the Long Lines building. A noted journalist once quipped the building sports the largest blank wall in the world, and the building looks like something the Soviets built in the 1970s. But the elitist New York Times, it praises that monster building, saying it is a rare building of its type in Manhattan that makes sense architecturally and that it blends into its surroundings more gracefully than any other skyscraper nearby. What the heck are they talking about? Does the New York Times apply common sense to anything these days? I'm not sure. The Long Lines building functions, by the way, as an NSA spy hub in New York, hidden in plain sight. Now, NSA, of course, is the National Security Agency, which is our na nation's um, intelligence gatherer under the Department of Defense. And the building serves as a secure communications hub and was built to withstand an atomic blast. No one is allowed to even approach the building, and absolutely no one is allowed to enter it. 
It appears across different TV shows and movies, by the way. As one example, the building prominently appears in the X-Files, the episode of This. And yeah, the next time you wander down or around Lower Manhattan, check out the Long Lines building. You'll know it when you see it. Cool history that evolved with telecom technology and now has a mysterious present with the NSA. They're always listening. And thank you for listening to another episode of The Far Middle. We'll connect again in seven days. Happy March, everybody.